Hey everyone, uh, my name is JJ Allaire. I work at our studio and I'm here today to talk about a new uh, scientific and technical publishing system called Quarto and then specifically how, uh, how Quarto can be used with Julia. So a little bit of a roadmap. Um, I'll cover first what is Quarto, uh, where does it fit among other projects you might, uh, might use or be aware of, talk a little bit about the concept of scientific markdown, which is a, a, an important thing that underpins uh, Quarto and its design philosophy, talk a little bit about the different types of output you can create with Quarto. That includes different types of documents, but also websites, books, presentations, blogs. So we'll kind of cover that and provide some examples of, of using Julia uh, with all of those formats. And then take a little more of a deep dive into Quarto uh, and how specifically it works with Julia and, and how uh, some of the ins and outs of that, how, how some of that can be made better, et cetera. So let's start with the very basics, which is what specifically is Quarto. Um, you might actually be familiar with other systems that are similar to Quarto. I would call it a, a literate programming system uh, in the tradition of org mode or Sweave or uh, in Julia, you may have seen weave.jl, R Markdown, Jupyter Book. Um, basically, the fundamental idea is that um, we want to create a scientific and technical publishing system that uses Markdown uh, and enhances it with features that are required for scientific communication. So first and foremost of those is the incorporation of computations uh, into documents and publications. Again, at, at the Core, we're going to use Markdown. Uh, traditionally, in scientific communication, there's a, there's a there's a substantial tradition of using LaTeX, and as you'll see, the the flavor of Markdown that that is used within Quarto and within Pandoc uh, borrows a lot from LaTeX, and in fact, is able to incorporate LaTeX directly. Uh, and then we'll talk about the again, as I said, the different types of output that can be created. So where did this project come from? Um, it's an open source project. It's sponsored uh, primarily by our studio. Uh, and it actually comes out of about 10 years of experience with a, another system, a similar system, called R Markdown. That, that, as I said, that was actually announced 10 years ago, almost, uh, almost to the day here. Uh, and we worked on R Markdown for about 10 years. And I developed a lot of good sound core ideas. And, and the p folks in the R community got a huge amount of value out of uh, the system. Um, but um, as we're all aware, um, the number of languages and runtimes and environments used for scientific discourse is very broad. Um, there's R, there's Julia, there's Python, there's Scala, and there will be many more. Um, and what we really wanted to do was take all of the uh, experience you had with R Markdown build a new system, kind of reimagined uh, with the benefit of hindsight, and make that system fundamentally multi-language and multi-engine, so, so not tied to R in any way, and, and not tied to Python in any way, or Julia in any way. It, it sort of is able to work with lots of different languages and engines uh, that, are available na that are available now and, and in the future. And so I, I also, before I wanted to get into more of the mechanics, and the how and the what, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the goals of the project. Um, one is this idea of computational documents, and that is documents that incorporate the source code required for their production directly inside the document. Um, and this can take the uh, form of notebooks, which we're all familiar with, but also there are pl plain text flavors of computational documents. The goal here is principally reproducibility, the ability to, to replicate the, the the studies and documents and analyses that we create, um, and also um, automation. Automation leads to reproducibility, but it's also a significant practical benefit to working this way. So we want to provide a system that makes it easier than not to create computational documents. Um, we have this, also this idea of scientific markdown, and if uh, I'm sure many or most of you are familiar with preparing scientific manuscripts, and you can see here, if you try to use a tool like Microsoft Word, uh, it might be relatively smooth going at the beginning, but the, 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 the requirements of technical documents quickly escalate and make a tool like Word quite unwieldy. Uh, you may uh, have used LaTeX, which starts out, you can see the red line here, um, at a higher bar of, um, of difficulty uh, of use, 
but it's a relatively flat curve once you, once you um, climb up to that bar. So LaTeX's been a great system for creating technical documents, but it, it, it is not the most accessible. Markdown is, in some ways has some similarities to LaTeX in that it's a plain text format that's sort of compiled or rendered to a final document. Um, and it's not nearly as capable as LaTeX. It's easier to start with, kind of approaching as easy as using something like Word, um, but then it, um, it doesn't quite have the features and functionality of LaTeX. So our, our, our goal here really is to take Markdown, hopefully take that line all the way down to where Word starts, make it extremely easy to work with Markdown, but then have a, a system whose complexity scales a lot more like LaTeX once you learn the basics of it then it's very straightforward to do sophisticated things. Um, and another goal is, is this idea of single source publishing. Uh, the content that we create oftentimes needs to go to multiple variations of HTML. Uh, they may need, may need to go to print. Um, it may need to go to uh, become a Word document or presentation, um, EPUB books. There's lots of different uh, ultimate locations that we need to deploy our content to and we, we really like to write it one time and that's what a system like Markdown uh, or, or, or an approach to publishing that is afforded by Markdown leads to. Okay, so let's take a simple concrete example of Cordo. This is a Markdown document. You can see on the top there's some metadata which um, gives basic information, title, author, also points to a specific uh, Jupyter kernel to use, in this case Julia 1.7, and then you see some Markdown uh, you see a code block there, an executable code block. It's got a little bit of Julia code in it. Uh, it's got some other metadata in it, some options specifying a label and a caption. Um, and this is a, a, a complete Quarto document. And, and, you, and what you can see on the bottom is we can render that document to a wide variety of different formats. So let me show you a little bit of what that rendered content looks like. You can see HTML is a, is a web page. PDF, you can kind of tell from the typography that this is something that was produced by LaTeX, but um, that's a PDF variation of the same document produced from the same code. Um, you can see a Word version of the same document and then a PowerPoint slide produced from the same code. So one uh, set of code uh, producing multiple formats. Um, I want to dig a little bit more into this code cell construct because you, you, if you're familiar with Markdown, you've seen just a normal tick, tick, tick Julia would be like, I would like to include some uh, Julia code for the reader. Those braces around the Julia indicate this is an executable code block, which means it's going to be run when rendered. Um, the code is executed and its output is included in the document. Uh, you can see on the top there's some special comments that provide options. In this case, echo false means don't show the source code. And there's a whole bunch of different options. I won't uh, enumerate them or recount them all here, but as you can see from the slide, lots of different ways to control how output is handled from code cells. Um, talking a little, in a little bit more depth about kind of how the rendering pipeline works, we, there I was showing you a QMD file, which is a markdown text file. And it's essentially picked apart into a Julia code chunks and markdown. The Julia code chunks are executed using Jupyter and specifically iJulia. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, soon. Uh, turned into Markdown, sent to Pandoc, and then that is used then to render into final output formats. That's for the, the scenario of a, a QMD file. Uh, you can also just take a, an IPINB file directly. So an IPINB file, a Jupyter Notebook with Julia, uh, of the Julia kernel, and you can render that directly to Markdown and onto Pandoc and then into all the various target output formats. So let's go through some examples of what this sort of scientific markdown looks like in Quarto. Um, you can see this is some markdown syntax that's um, citing things inside a work. Uh, bibliographies can be specified in lots of different formats, including BibTeX and, and CSL. And you can see by, when I use that markdown, then the citations are resolved in the document. Uh, and when bibliographies are rendered, there's, as you know, many disciplines have many different variations and standards for how uh, citations and bibliographies are formatted. And there's a thing called the citation style language that allows you to, uh, once you've got that bibliography, output citations in actually over 10,000 different styles. So very robust support for citations. Uh, also support for cross-references. Um, this is, I want to reference a figure, I want to reference a sub-figure, uh, I want to reference a table, an equation, um, and I want to have those references automatically numbered and resolved 
uh, in my document rather than having to, to track them manually. So this is an example of you know for referencing a figure and a subfigure. Um, again, we can do this for tables, equations, theorems, sections. Uh, I can show you a little bit of what the syntax for that looks like in Markdown. Here I'm defining a, a uh, couple of figures with an HTML looking HTML ID, uh, and then I reference it here, and you can see then those references are automatically resolved. Uh, the same thing works for uh, computations. Uh, here's an example of a, I believe it's a Jupiter, uh, this is where I thought I was going to be. Um, I won't show that now. But basically, if you have a code cell that produces a couple of plots, um, you can say, I'd like to be able to cross-reference those plots, and the numbering system will, will also work with computational outputs. Uh, Callouts are another thing that are quite useful, used very often in, in books um, that allow you to highlight uh, specific pieces of content uh, different ways. Uh, and then um, if you're f familiar with um, uh, LaTeX, the LaTeX grid system, there's quite a bit that can be done for, to do sophisticated layout of pages, including the use of one or both margins, uh, kind of putting notes in the margin, putting content in the margins, having figures or code span to use the full page while still maintaining um, an optimal reading width. Um, we have a lot of tools in Cordo for advanced page layout. So as an example of some of the different kind of columns, including full bleed, full width, kind of treatments of things. Um, we also have lots of ways to use the margin. So you can use the mar you can put content in the margin, but also something that's very popular here is putting an equation or a side note or even footnotes uh, in the margin. So lots of tools for advanced page layout. And then finally, um, we have integrated support for embedding diagrams, either mermaid diagrams or, or graph viz diagrams. Um, so this is an example of a mermaid, of a mermaid diagram, very helpful for, for a lot of technical publications. Okay, let's talk a little bit about output formats. Um, lots of different document formats. I've highlighted HTML, PDF, and Word, but uh, JATS, Context, RTF, ASCII doc, um, lots and lots, there's probably over 30 different formats supported. Um, um, presentations, lots of different formats available for creating presentations. Uh, Reveal.js does HTML presentations. We can create PowerPoint presentations, uh, Beamer presentations as well. Um, lots of advanced features in Reveal.js, speaker notes, printing to PDF, uh, animations. Uh, I'll give an example here of a Julia presentation um, and they're taking advantage of Julia to do some fancy diagrams. Um, just flick through here quickly. Um, but this is a, an HTML presentation created uh, to talk about a Julia package. Websites are another, another uh, very useful type of content you can create. Um, here's an example of a Julia workshop for data science. You can see website with the kind of navigation you'd expect. You can see uh, you'd expect call outs, code blocks. So this is a website and you know mostly all this navigation that is sort of provided automatically by the website framework. Search is provided automatically. Um, so very convenient way to publish collections of documents. And then the Quarto website itself actually uses, uses Quarto. As you can see here we've got hundreds of documents that are easily navigable um, and also support search. So websites, books are sort of in, in some ways a, a variation of website. Uh, they inherit all the features of Corda websites, so navigation, search, etc. cetera. Uh, but they also support cross-references across chapters. So when you reference a figure from chapter two and you're in chapter five, it'll say figure 2.3. Um, and it also supports uh, print formats, so uh, books support uh, PDFs, Word documents, EPUBs, as well as, uh, as essentially a website for your book. And here is a book example created by Doug Bates uh, about mixed effects models with Julia. And you can see here's examples of you know, hiding and showing code. Uh, there are some cross references in here. You can see some citations, tables. Um, and I don't see a download for it, but it would be, again, possible from the same source 
to create a, a PDF of this book or an EPUB version of this book. So here's a cross-reference there. So the books. And then blogs are another sort of, another variation of websites uh, that, that, again, can have just p any old pages you want uh, and can have arbitrary navigation and search. But also blogs are collections of posts uh, and so we'll, we can automatically generate a listing, automatically generate an RSS feed. Uh, here's an example of a blog created for Julia. And you can see um, here's a list of posts. Uh, okay, do that. You can see um, it's got its own kind of theme. I, I won't cover it in this talk, but Gordo has lots and lots of different themes, and you as the as the publisher can, can create your own themes or, or adapt themes that, that are created by others. So this is an example of a blog created with uh, Quarto and Julia. Okay, so let's talk more specifically about how Quarto and Julia can be used together, how we actually execute Julia computations, what are some of the uh, drawbacks uh, and opportunities for improvement. So well, you wanna, if you want to use Quarto with Julia, um, First thing you need is you do need Jupyter, because we're going to use Jupyter to kind of manage execution and collect output uh, from execution. So you install Jupyter, uh, and then you install iJulia, uh, the iJulia kernel. That's all that's required. It's recommended, and I'll explain why in a minute, that you also uh, add the revise package. And so the basic workflow, and this really applies to, to Julia or Python or R or, or any engine that you would use with Quarto, is to uh, you say Quarto render to render a document. I showed that earlier. Uh, you, s you can also render a notebook. So if you prefer to work in a, in a notebook versus plain text, you can just render the notebook directly. And then preview, I'll get into kind of Quarto tooling in a few minutes, but uh, preview lets you uh, preview documents and as you save them and work with them, the, the preview is automatically updated. So that's a nice iterative workflow. Uh, that you can use before doing final rendering. So uh, this is an example of that preview. So this is an example of I've, I've got a Julia notebook in Jupyter Lab, and as I work with the notebook and save it, then the 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 preview on the right is automatically updated. All right, so let's talk a little bit about iJulia. Um, if if Quarto sees a Julia code cell inside your document. Uh, it's automatically going to assume that it wants to use the the, uh, the iJulia Jupyter kernel. Um, it'll find the most recent version of Ju the Julia kernel on your system, but you can also pick a specific version by specifying in this example for the for ex for example here Julia 1.7 directly. Um, iJulia executes Julia code and then transforms it to either plain text, graphics, Markdown, HTML. Uh, it knows how to take Julia output and all, and render it into something that can then that can then be published. Um, one piece that I'll get into in a little more depth in a minute is that for interactive sessions, we don't want to, to absorb the startup time of the kernel uh, for every document render, so Quarter will keep the Jupyter kernel resident uh, to mitigate this, and then revise is used to make sure that if there are changes to dependent files or packages that occur while that long-running session exists, that they are that they're updated and refreshed. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, how we manage two types of performance. So one is startup performance, which is how long does it take to load the interpreter and packages and how often do I need to do that? And then rendering performance, how, how expensive are computations and how frequently do we need to run them? Um, startup performance I talked about a little bit uh, with the, this idea of keeping a kernel daemon around uh, to mitigate startup costs. Um, that hello QMD example from earlier takes about 30 seconds on first run on my machine, but it takes less than a half a second on subsequent runs. So keeping that kernel around is really valuable. Uh, but then that creates the, the problem of stale code. Um, and that, again, the, the solution to that is revise, uh, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with for just, just uh, uh, long running REPL sessions. Uh, and you can add revise uh, so that it always runs inside iJulia by adding this code. This is all documented on the Revise website, adding this code to the iJulia uh, startup. So Revise, people have found to be a, a great addition uh, to iJulia when, when working with Quarto. Thinking about rendering performance, um, you know, and this has nothing to do with startup performance, this is just 
how long do my computations take? And if I'm, if I'm working iteratively on a document and focusing on content, I don't always want to rerun all my computations. So there's a few approaches to that. Uh, one is um, just authoring inside a notebook allows you to control exactly when code execution occurs and, and actually cache the results in the notebook. So that's one approach. Um, Jupyter Cache, which is a, a package you can install separately, will actually do caching of all your cell outputs. Um, it's all or nothing, so if any of your code changes, it's got to re-execute the whole document. But again, if you've done your, your, if you've done your computations and you're now you're writing and doing analysis, this allows you to re-render with zero, zero computations. And then I won't get into all the mechanics of it, but Quarto has a freeze feature that allows you to also, uh, separate from cache, it's a little more explicit um, and durable, you can permanently save and reuse computational output. So for example, a blog post that you wrote three years ago, you don't want to have to keep re-rendering that, um, and so that, that, that can be saved. Or if you're deploying code to a server that may or may not have the permissions and software required um, to, um, to render, you may want to render everything locally, have it freeze, and then deploy the kind of frozen execution uh, results onto the server. Um, we pick, picked iJulia mostly because we had made a bunch of investments to make working the, the working of Quarto and Jupyter to be work really well. Um, one was this kernel daemonization uh, and caching work. Um, iJulia ha also had implemented a lot of primitives for um, supporting um, MIME outputs from Julia results, and that's including the ability to output raw LaTeX, which ends up being important for some more sophisticated uh, tables. Um, and the fact that uh, as a format, uh, IPYNB was, was supported in a bunch of popular notebook front ends, JupyterLab, VS Code, et cetera. So I think it aligned well with a lot of infrastructure that both we had and that users were taking advantage of. But it's definitely uh, conceivable that the other notebook or literate programming systems like Pluto or Neptune, uh, they could be integrated as an alternative, uh, as an alternative to iJulia. So that's something we'd, be, we'd certainly be interested in talking about. The, the execution engine system is, uh, is intended for, for future uh, extensions and it's pluggable, so it's something that we could definitely do. Um, a little bit about tools. Um, we have a VS Code extension for Quarto, which I won't uh, I won't go into exhaustive detail on all the different features, but it's a it's a, a pretty deep feature uh, feature wise. Um, specifically as regards to Julia, it integrates with the uh, the Julia VS Code extension. So here I've got a Julia QMD document, and I'm doing render and side by side render and preview. Uh, here I'm actually able to run, you can see run cell, I can run individual cells in the QMD and their results are put in the interactive Julia session that's running in the terminal as well as the plots displayed. Uh, and then we also integrate with the Julia VS Code extension for code completion. So lots of, lots of uh, good, good productivity tools available if you're a VS Code user. Um, as I showed before, we also integrate pretty well with JupyterLab. Um, you can run Quarto Preview on a notebook, launch it in JupyterLab, and then as you're working with it and you save it, uh, there's a browser preview of it that, that refreshes automatically. Um, you can also use Quarto Preview specifically with any text editor. Just type Quarto Preview, julia.qmd or julia.ipynb from, uh, from any terminal, and you'll get live reloading from whatever editor you're in, and there's actually um, some Quarto extensions available for popular editors, um, some of which we maintain, some of which others maintain. So Emacs Vim, uh, NeoVim. I'll make the link to these slides available at the end of the talk so you can find those links if you need to. And that is, in fact, the end of the talk. And that, that is, there is the link to the slides. Um, we've got the Quarto website, uh, specifically the Quarto and Julia article you can see linked to there, repeats a lot of the the, the Quarto and Julia section. So if that went a little bit fast, that, that uh, breaks it down in much more detail and has more step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, the Getting Started gives you a tutorial that walks you through the basics of how to use the system. Uh, and we'd love to hear from folks um, at our, our discussions or, or GitHub issues. So and I'd also love uh, to hear any questions that people have now. Thank you. <laughs>